There were four of us in the car, and we had just come back from grabbing some cheap dinner because we were in college, and, and that's just what we were doing. And Last week, I told you the story of my life flashing before my eyes, and it got me thinking to other times that I was in interesting situations in automobiles in college, and I remember this night where we all were coming back from a town about 15 minutes away from where we went to school, and we'd all piled into a car probably to go eat cheap chicken wings somewhere on an all-you-can-eat night because those were glorious before the price of chicken wings exploded, and now you can buy a steak for what you can get chicken wings for. And, and we went, and we just filled up. And on the way back to school, we saw this car in a ditch. And, and we drove by, and we slowed down, and, and we saw that there was a, a single woman standing outside of the car. And Matt was driving. And he said, I think we should turn around and go help her. And someone else in the car said, I think it's a scam and we're all going to die. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> Matt turned his car around. And we approached the woman, visibly shaken and upset. And the four of us, pushed her car for her out of the ditch. And with tears in her eyes, she thanked us so much, offered us what little money she had. We didn't accept it. And she drove away. And we got back in the car. And someone asked, well, what if she would have tried to rob us? I have weird friends. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> and another one, the, other, the fourth person in the car said, yeah, what if she had a gun? And I said, well, I was just banking on the fact I could outrun at least one of you. <laughs> and then we started arguing over which of us was the slowest. And a couple minutes later, Matt said, I have no idea whether or not she would have had a gun. I had no idea what her intentions were. But from looking at the situation, I knew she needed help. And I was in the position to help her. So I felt responsible to do just that. We ask our kids a lot, what do you want to be? What do you want to be when you grow up? And oftentimes that has career overtures. And that's not a bad question. It's a great thing to get them thinking about, to have them start to process, to dream, envision. And yet if we keep that in the realm of career, we miss some great opportunities as parents and grandparents, as mentors. Because as people that love and follow Jesus, we need to be people that set the tone. That when we think about what we want to be and who we want to be, and as we ask our kids, what do you want to be? We need to put as much and probably more emphasis on the character aspect of that answer than the career aspect. And so I hope when my kids process, what do you want to be when you get older? The first answer that comes to their mind isn't a career. But instead it's loving and kind, full of joy, compassionate. These are the things that I hope for them. And the question that all of us have to wrestle with is, is who are we? And who do we want to be? Because there's room for growth for all of us. And that's the process that God takes us through after we make the decision to give our lives to Jesus. The God's work in us is not done at the moment we decide we would follow after him. But in a sense, it's just beginning. 
And then God goes to work in us and goes through a process called sanctification. And I know that's a big word, but ultimately what that means is that we look more and more like God and less and less like ourselves. That God transforms who we are. And today as we conclude the book of Acts, and it's been a long journey, and a journey I didn't intend when we started this to go all the way through. But the more that I prayed about it and the, and the more that I, I read, I just felt like this is something that was invaluable for us as a church and as a ministry to go through and examine how God has worked in the past and the ways that we can put that into practice in our lives and the ways and the implications that that has for us, not just as individuals, but corporately as a church. And we have seen God do miraculous things. We've seen incredible things happen as the message of Jesus has continued to spread. And we have seen things happen that I don't think any of us would say, hey, that sounds like a lot of fun. I hope that happens to me. But we don't get to decide that. And today we conclude. And I don't know about you, but I love a good movie, and I love generally a happy ending at the end of a good movie. However, sometimes that doesn't happen. And we just last week saw Acts chapter 27, and we saw how Paul, who we've really tracked ever since Acts chapter 12, was shipwrecked. And as the book ends, I would love to be able to tell you, well, everything just ends perfectly. We're going to go to Acts chapter 28. If you have your phones or your Bibles, I hope you'll follow along with us in the Bible app. It's a free resource that you can find in whatever app store you utilize, and once it's installed on your device, the feature that we use every week here at Lakeside is called Events. Either enable your locations or write in Lakeside Algoma will pop up and you can follow along with us that way. If you have a traditional Bible with you this morning, we are concluding our look at Acts. Acts is the fifth book in the New Testament right after the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and before the book of Romans. That is where you can find Acts, Acts chapter 28. If you're joining us via the stream this morning, thanks so much for watching. My name is Brian, and I'm part of the team here at Lakeside, and the verses will be available for you. On the screen below, Acts chapter 28, verses 1 and 2 is where we're going to start this morning. And there we read these words. After we were brought safely through, we then learned that the island where the shipwreck had occurred, and they got off the boats and washed ashore, was called Malta. The native people showed us unusual kindness. for They kindled a fire and welcomed us all because it had begun to rain and was cold. So here are these people who inhabit an island, and all of a sudden there's a shipwreck, and you have prisoners, and you have soldiers, you have officials all coming to shore, and here are the locals, and what do they do? They offer them unusual kindness. They build them a fire to keep them warm. They welcome them. This says a lot about the type of people that inhabited Malta. Then when there are all these strangers, and again, many of them were prisoners who come ashore, they welcome them. And make a fire. And again, we just have to wrestle with what kind of people do we want to be? What kind of people do we want to be? And, and this is something that somebody told me a long time ago. And it stuck with me for, for a really long time. I said, always remember this, Brian. People will forget what you say. But they won't forget how you make them feel. People will forget the words that you say, but they won't forget how you make them feel. And as people that love and follow Jesus, we need to set the standard. 
for being kind people, for being loving people. We need to be the people that set the standard for that. Not people that come off angry, not people that always seem like we have an ax to grind or a grudge against somebody, but we must set the tone. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. When the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. Are you kidding me? You have been arrested. You have been put on trial after trial after trial. You have been been people have attempted to assassinate you they they've beaten you you've been shipwrecked and now a snake is gonna latch onto your hand like that's just a bad string that i mean people are losing their faith over this stuff and here you're just scratching your head. I mean, we got to be like, God, what are you doing? What are you doing? At what point do you put a hedge of protection around your servants? Where are you and what's going on? And the people who saw this believed in karma. They said, well, hey, he's a murderer. Clearly, he thought he was going to escape. No doubt this man is a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. And this is yet another reminder for us that the gospel, the hope of Jesus, is actually the antithesis to karma. Karma tells us you, you get what you put out. The message of Jesus says you deserve judgment. You deserve wrath. You've rebelled against your creator. You violated his standard. He is a holy, perfect God. You, as good of a person as you are and as you can be, are not perfect. And yet the message of the cross of Jesus tells us that hope and salvation and forgiveness and freedom is available to all of us, not because of anything we've done or put out into the world, but because of what God came to this world to put out for us. The people here see the snake, the viper. They're like, he's dead. He, however, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. They were waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But when they had waited a long time and so saw no misfortune come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a God. And now we have a miraculous event. Now we have just a miraculous event. He shakes it off into the fire. They're all waiting for him to swell up and to die. And nothing happens. Nothing happens. And the people see this miraculous event, and they draw the conclusion, Paul must be a god. He must be a god. There's no other way to explain this. That's a death sentence. And he's all right. Now, in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the chief man of the island, named Publius, who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. It happened that the father of Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery. And Paul visited him and prayed, and putting his hands on him, healed him. And when this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. They also honored us greatly, and when we were about to sail, they put on board whatever we needed. Publius's father is sick. Paul shows up, he prays over him, he puts his hands on him, and all of a sudden, he is healed. And as incredible and as miraculous as that is, it doesn't stop there. This extends throughout the entire island. 
The people on all the island are cured. The God is working through this island. Now, why do we spend so much time talking about this? And the reason we spend so much time talking about this is really Acts chapter 28, fast forward to Romans chapter 1, those two chapters answer a philosophical question that if you love and follow Jesus, you've probably wrestled with, or if you haven't yet, you're probably going to wrestle with after today, you're welcome, and just, you know, something to think through. But the message of the gospel of Jesus is this, that there is one path to salvation. Salvation is found in no one else. There's no other name under heaven given to man by which you can be saved. Acts 4.12 tells us that, that Jesus is the exclusive way to salvation, and he is our hope. So then the question that we have to wrestle with is, does God love all people? When we know from Scripture, the answer to that question is yes. Does God desire everyone to be saved? Yes, he does. Also, Scripture explicitly states that. So here comes the question, and it's probably something you've wrestled with or or you've thought about, or it's something that a cynic or a skeptic might throw your way sometime. What about the person in some remote village that hasn't been reached with language or technology, who never has an opportunity to hear the message of Jesus. Is it fair for that person to be condemned? And if you've never thought of that, my bad. I should have like given a disclaimer. But you fast forward to Romans chapter 1. And what Romans chapter 1 tells us, the very next chapter in the Bible, it tells us this. That everyone, everywhere, is without excuse. And the reason that everyone, everywhere, is without excuse is because when you look at the cosmos, when you look at everything around you, it is only a fool who can look at all of this and say, well, there is no creator. This is all just some random happenstance that all of this exists in the, pers- in the perfect rhythms and motions that exist in our world with, with all of the synergies combined to make everything function without it just all blowing up. So that everyone everywhere is without excuse. Well, the question then is, so is it enough just to acknowledge, well, that there's a creator somewhere? And, And the answer to that question is no. But then the question is, well, what happens? And here's our answer. Acts 28 is our answer. That God is big enough in his sovereignty and in his divinity to see that individual. And to know their heart. And to provide a means. And in Acts chapter 28, what is that means? That means is a shipwreck of his servant Paul to come to some random island to heal some people, to open the door to their heart, to be receptive to the message of Christ. And this is the way that God works. So that everyone can be without excuse because what happens when you recognize, well, there is a creator, that's called general revelation. When you understand that there is a God, and once you pursue that path, God in his sovereignty will make a way that the message will be revealed to you. We see it right here. How many of us want to sign up to be that answer? To send the hope of Jesus to people in need? And a lot of us would say, well, yes. I want to tell people about the hope of Jesus. I want to be the answer to that. And if that's true of you, that's fantastic. But here's what I want to remind you. It took a shipwreck. And being bitten by a viper. We don't always understand what God's up to. We don't always understand why we face some of the hardship and some of the heartache that we face. But I promise you this. 
even if you get to the point where it makes no sense and you never on this side of eternity understand what God is up to. God's thoughts are not our thoughts and God's ways are not our ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are God's ways higher than our ways and God's thoughts higher than our thoughts. That's what the prophet Isaiah wrote in Isaiah chapter 55. God has a plan for your life. God has a purpose and a reason for why he puts you, where he puts you, when he puts you. And it might result in you facing some things you don't want to face and doing some things you don't want to do. But the people in Malta are exposed to the hope of Christ because of a shipwreck and a viper. After three months, we set sail in a ship that had wintered in the island, a ship of Alexandria, with the twin gods as a figurehead, putting it in at Syracuse. We stayed there for three days, and from there, we made a circuit and arrived at Regium. And after one day, a south wind sprang up, and on the second day, we we came to Puteoli. There we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days, and so we came to Rome. And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Apius and three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. Now, when fellow people who also love and follow Jesus heard about Paul and the crew arriving, they came, and what did they do? They encouraged their hearts. This is why it matters to live in community. This is why it matters not to be isolated. And I recognize that one of the great things about this time of year, around the Christmas, around the Christmas season, is the opportunity to have that community. And I also understand one of the horrible things about Christmas time is the opportunity to have that community. Okay? My in-laws are arriving 36 hours earlier than I thought they were. I get it. I get it. It's a joke, everyone. Not really. It's a joke. (laughs) We all need people that refill us, that charge us. We all know the drainers. We all have people who drain our energies in life. And the challenge is that we can't allow the drainers to get us to the point where we don't want to have community with people that fill us anymore. Find those people that speak life into you, that encourage you, that you can just spend time with and you leave energized, and excited, and make it a point, make it a point to spend time with those people. This is what community should be, that we're there to encourage people. We're there to meet their needs, and it's something that we all need. And when they came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. And after three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews. And when they had gathered, he said to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. When they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar though I had no charge to bring against my nation. Paul summarizing what he has faced, how he's been treated unfairly and unjustly. He's telling his story. He continues, For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. And they said to him, We have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are. For with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. And now he has an opportunity. 
an opportunity to share with a whole new audience who's understood some of the messaging but doesn't understand the heart of the message of Christ. And now he has the opportunity to share with them the hope of Jesus. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him in his lodging in greater numbers. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And now Paul has this incredible audience, and he's telling them all about the hope of Jesus. And some of them give their lives and follow after Christ. And some don't. Some believe. Some do not. And This is where I just want to remind you, it is not our job to convert anyone. We leave that up to God. That God can change people's hearts. That God can open up their eyes. The job that we've been instructed to do, the job that we're responsible to do, is to proclaim the hope of Jesus, is to love the people that we encounter. That's it. That is our job. When we stand before God one day, He's not going to have a grade sheet and say, well, when you talked about your faith in this situation, you could have done a lot better job here to close the deal. This isn't a sales job. It isn't a pitch. What I have, I want you to experience because it has changed my life. It has changed me to the core. It has changed my identity. It has changed who I am. And what it has offered me is to live a life that is fulfilling, that is full of peace. I want that for you. But if you don't want that for you, if you don't want to have a relationship with the God who created you, there's nothing I can really do about that. And I don't feel a responsibility to try to convince you of it. I will present the evidence for why I've placed my trust in Christ. I will tell you the hope of placing my trust in Christ. But ultimately, if you decide, I don't want that for me, I'm not going to argue with you about it. Some believed, and some didn't. And when I share my hope in Christ and, and people dismiss it, that doesn't discourage me. I want it for them. I hope they'll find it for them. But I am not discouraged, and I am not defeated because someone else chooses to not respond by placing their faith and trust in Christ. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will indeed hear but never understand, and you will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and with their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. The hope of Christ is available, but it's up to you to respond. God's desire is to save you, but it's up to you to respond. The choice is yours. What do you choose? And nobody can make that choice for you. You can't be a parent or a grandparent, a spouse, a coworker, a friend, a neighbor. It, it's ultimately up to you. What will you choose? And then Acts closes with this. He lived there two whole years. 
at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. As Job ends, we see God do some incredible things. He restores to Job more than he ever had to begin with. Blesses him in incredible ways. As we see Acts end, we see Paul remains somewhere for two years. He isn't given a mansion. He isn't given a major platform. He doesn't have all the luxuries that could be heaped upon him. What he has for two years is he welcomes all who come to him. He proclaims to them the hope of Jesus without apology. This is his life. This is what he did. And this is who we should be. As individuals and as a church. And God has blessed us. And his favor has been on us and we see that and we acknowledge it and we are thankful for it and we appreciate it. But that doesn't mean that serving him is always going to be easy. And it doesn't mean it's going to constantly be fun. We are going to face challenges. There are going to be circumstances and situations that happen that make no sense to us. And we're going to shake our heads and just be like, God, you're all powerful. You have control of everything. How about we not have to get shipwrecked? How about we not be bitten by vipers? How about we not be imprisoned? How about you make the proclamation of the hope, the message that you, that you personified when you sent your son Jesus and he died on the cross and he rose again three days later and now we take that message and we take that hope and we boldly proclaim it and we lift high the name of Jesus. How about you make that easier for us? Sometimes God will. And sometimes we'll be shipwrecked. And sometimes we'll be bitten by vipers. Because there's people in Malta who need to hear about Jesus. And sometimes when those people hear, they'll find the hope of salvation. And sometimes when they hear, they'll walk away, shaking their heads in disbelief. We can't control that, but here's what we can control. That we can be people who love everyone that we encounter, and in the same way that Paul, for two years, welcomed all who came to him, so must we. So must we. 
that Lakeside exists to reach every single person that we can with the hope of Jesus. And our doors are open, and we say to people, come as you are. And when they do, we love them. And we point them to Jesus. Because don't get us wrong, we want people to come as they are, but we don't want them to stay that way. And the reason is because God doesn't want them to stay that way. God doesn't want us to stay the way that we are. There's a process that he is working on in every single one of us. And in a culture that tells everybody, you're perfect just the way you are, our message is countercultural. We say you're not okay. You're not. You have a problem. And your problem isn't your parents' fault. Your problem isn't your boss's fault. Your problem isn't your spouse's fault or your ex-spouse's fault or your third ex-spouse's fault, wherever you fall there. Your, Your problem isn't your kids. It's you. It's me, too. And in a culture and a society that tells everybody, no, you're perfect. You just got to love yourself more. You just got to accept yourself. We say, hey, we hope you do love yourself because God made you and he created you. You are valuable. You are loved. But there's also a way that you can be even more. That's when you have a relationship with your creator. And that's what we must be. A place that loves everyone. We welcome everyone. And we never shy away from the message of Jesus. And we recognize some will accept it. And some won't. But we keep proclaiming the hope that is found in him. God, I pray that we will be these type of people. I pray this will be what defines Lakeside. A collection of people that love you first and foremost, Jesus. To love each other. And love our community. God, we ask that you would use us in a really big way. And Lord, we trust you. Because we know when we ask that, it's probably going to lead us some places that we may not want to go. Having to encounter some things we don't want to encounter. But God, you have a plan. So I pray especially in the seasons and in the times, we have no idea what you're up to. Or even worse, we know and we don't like what you're up to. I pray that you'd give us faith. You'd help us remember that you are a God who loves us you have a plan and it's bigger than what we can see so God I pray that that would be what's true of each of us individually and then I pray God it would be what we are corporately use us Jesus for your glory name we pray.